Um, now we'll uh, uh, transition to uh, our first speaker, um, and that is uh, Mr. Don Close. Don's um, uh, an animal protein analyst at uh, Rabo AgriFinance, and uh, based in the St. Louis area, um, and uh, works in the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Group. Um, uh, Mr. Close is responsible for analyzing all animal protein sectors and specializes in beef cattle. Um, in, prior to joining uh, Rabo AgriFinance, Close served as market director for the Texas Cattle Feeders Association uh, in Amarillo, Texas, representing uh, cattle feeders in Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Uh, he previously held roles uh, with Aztec Cattle Company in Hereford, Texas, uh, Future Beef Operations based then in Parker, Colorado, and PHI Marketing Services at Pioneer Hybrid International uh, in Des Moines. Uh, Don has conducted research on a wide range uh, of topics, including confinement cow-calf operations, uh, lean, finely trimmed uh, beef and ground beef products, um, and development of international trade. Uh, he is a regular speaker for state, national, and international livestock groups across North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Currently, Close authors bi-monthly columns for the National Cattlemen's Publication and is working on market issues at the intersection of marketing and ag policy. Uh, Don is a graduate of West Texas A&M University and has a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics. Um, so with that, we'll ask Don to come on board. Um, and uh, Don, if you can un unmute and uh, um, turn your video on, we'll be uh, um, ready to um, send control uh, over to you and um, you should have it. So um, Don, welcome uh, aboard. I look forward to uh, your comments. Your, your video is coming through great. Uh, um, if, if I can't hear you when you start talking, I'll, I'll holler at you, but the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you for joining right. us. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. What I was, uh, was asked to talk about is uh, sustainability and uh, kind of give an overview of what we're seeing from the, uh, the bank's global team on, on what different countries are doing on the sustainability front. And you know, the whole, this whole sustainability discussion, if it were not uh, important enough before, it most certainly is now. So with all of the attention that has uh, been brought to the marketplace through the, uh, the whole COVID episode, uh, we've had the, uh, the, the plants closing because of health situ situations. We've had uh, a whole lot of attention brought to the living conditions uh, that, that a lot of the employees are going through. We've had attention brought to the marketplace for the whole topic of euthanizing hogs. Uh, we've got the topic going on for the delayed days and additional tonnage building up in, in the feed yard space. And with all of this attention, um, we're going to have a whole new uh, cast of, of inspectors and inquiries and a level of attention that the industry uh, certainly not used to or, or certainly hasn't been used to in a long time. Uh, I think the, the increased awareness or introduction of the CDC into the plants, uh, increased uh, operations uh, or increased inspections from OSHA. You've got, uh, we've had this whole situation with state and local health departments wanting to get inside those plants to do their own inspections. Uh, as I've already mentioned, the, the animal welfare, animal rights group. And with all that, if that's not enough, we still got this, uh, this growing campaign and, and again, increased awareness from consumers demanding to know where their food comes from. So suddenly the, the requirements to explain, to document uh, production agriculture and especially animal agriculture uh, is going to be a whole new facet of, of our industry. Um, <clears throat> You know, what we've seen across the board is, is a destruction or certainly a really deep test of erosion and trust. Uh, that erosion you know, starts with consumers. It works its way to uh, both retailers and the HRI space. We've certainly had uh, the level of trust disrupted with, with packers, processors, where we were, go who was open, 
where we were storing meat once the restaurants closed. And that works all the way back down to uh, the cattle feeder, uh, the stalker operators and the cow calf space. So all of this is going to re require a, a reestablishment of those working relationships and a reestablishment of confidence and trust. And that, uh, that brings us right back to uh, this whole topic on the sustainability front <clears throat> and that uh, both the, the global round table and the, uh, the US round tables for sustainable beef are going to be in a position to play a, a, a critical role um, as we go forward. When, when the whole uh, sustainability front got started, you know, there was, a, there was a whole lot of emphasis placed on, on the environmental component of this. And, and if I think back through the timelines, I think the, the global round table was, uh, came about during one of those periods of time when we were, uh, we were having issues with the, the whole waters of the US thing, uh, just the, the label of the, the global marketplace and producers took, uh, immediately took the perception that they've got some international body and a whole new set of rules and regulations of what they can and can't do. And, and I, I think that was really a, a misunderstanding, misrepresentation. I think the real uh, piece of this that has come out over time is the, the number one point for any sustainability program is economic viability. And if those operations are not economically sound and returning a profit, there is no reason to go forward. Uh, and, and that's become way better understood over time. And then, as I've already talked about, but the, uh, this whole social responsibility uh, component of this maybe has been uh, under evaluated or, or under considered, but is now suddenly a, a really big issue. Uh, you know, fortunately, throughout this ordeal, we haven't had uh, any issues with with food safety complications, but but that social responsibility, not just to the individual, but social responsibility to the to the local community and social responsibility to our broader community. That it's more than just somebody on the ranch. That. Uh, We've got our, our, our local towns to, to give consideration to, uh, and we've got a much broader space of employees that are dependent uh, on animal agriculture uh, for us all to work out. So I talked some about the, uh, the global round table and, and, and the role of, the original role of the global round table was largely to, to organize and to set up uh, the 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 country or regional uh, roundtables. <clears throat> the um, as we go f and I th and I think one of the real um, stumbling blocks that the that the global roundtable ran into initially was they quickly found out there was no set uh, operational procedures global certainly globally but there's certainly no no set uh, set of of production practices between classes of cattle, uh, even between producers, state to state, or even neighbors. So that really increased the need to drill down to a higher label of uh, sustainability. And, and that's where the country uh, roundtables really started to, to be developed. One bit of, of, of concern that I have going forward is this whole sustainability front has been developed to a point now that I, I think we're seeing some very good work come out of the uh, specific country roundtables. I know from, from my own uh, involvement and, and observations of the US roundtable, uh, I know can, Canada has done some very good work. But so what does that do for the role of the of the global round table, are they, and they're, they've kind of been changed their emphasis to be the supporter or, or be a clearinghouse of information that's coming from each of the uh, specific country round tables. But if, as I go forward, just 
what is the role of the global and uh, U.S. roundtable or, or any, any country roundtable going forward? I think we need to do a little bit of a better understanding of what those uh, specific roles of each of those organizations will be going forward. And the role of the uh, of the U.S. Roundtable, uh, and I'm and I'm I know I'm far short here of covering everything that's going on, but the real objective of the uh, Roundtable is simply to serve as a as a clearinghouse of information and to be in the position as the go-to source that if we get uh, industry gets questions from consumer groups, if we get uh, pushback from any of the animal welfare groups that we have a body of well-researched, well-documented data that is shelf-ready or largely shelf-ready that when these issues come up, we can provide a really quick answer. Um, the other role is to provide equal representation from, from all parties in, the, uh, in the, the production value chain. <clears throat> And if you, I, I would encourage everyone, if you have not been uh, to one of the, the round table meetings, just set in on one of those. And, and when I first started attending those, those meetings, it was kind of that uh, classic, I felt like I was walking into a movie that was three quarters over. I, I was trying to, and, and the complexity of the discussion, when you are taking the needs and considerations of production agriculture, but you're also taking the, the needs of the processors, you're taking the needs and the questions, concerns that, uh, that the restaurant industry has, that the uh, purveyor industry has, and, the, and the, the questions that they're getting from, from their customers, um, it really leads to some very deep and detailed conversations and trying to come up with policy and with, uh, with talking points that equally meets the needs of those all of those different parties involved and at the end of the day it's really amazing um, for just how well that works out slow but but it works out very well uh, the other part uh, role for the round table is certainly to to serve as a, a source for benchmarking and continuous improvement and i and i didn't i didn't give the disclaimer when I was talking about the global and US roundtable, but I need to give the disclaimer that uh, Rabobank is members of both the, uh, the global roundtable and the US roundtable. Uh, we've got different, different employees that are the, the key go-to people for each of those organizations. And, and my involvement's way more involved with the US roundtable. Uh, but we, the bank is, uh, is an active member in both of those organizations. And really, we, we see value for our bank customers to be at that table. And we particularly like the component of, of benchmarking and continuous improvement uh, is, is why we're there. I talked about this one uh, already a little bit, but again, we need to, uh, I think we've got to to broaden that understanding of what the role of the round tables are. And, and again, we started off with the whole natural resources component of this, uh, but suddenly we're in a situation where people in the community, uh, the, the animal health and well being, food safety, uh, these are, are going to be way more front and center conversations as we go forward. Uh, and the role of the, uh, the round tables are very well suited uh, to be not the only spokesperson for on these topics, but to be a well-founded and well-researched source of information on these broader topics. So I'm gonna start uh, drifting, changing this conversation and, and kind of look at what we're seeing going on for the leading producing countries globally, and some of the uh, some of the activity. But you can see from the chart, uh, this is where cro cropland is uh, the distribution. And as we as this audience very well aware, the areas of the world that are suitable for food production or row crop pr production, even cereal grain production, 
is very, very limited. And how do we get the most of those resources in those uh, non-arable uh, areas? And you can look at the second slide of where we're seeing the distribution of livestock globally. And it's the whole, uh, you know, the, the upcycling of the ruminant and how we can take advantage and how we can produce enough uh, food uh, for the, the seven, seven and a half billion people today. But the, uh, the simple fact that we're going to be working and trying to feed 9.5 billion people uh, just 30 years from now, we very much need to take uh, advantage of the, uh, of the upcycling uh, and the resources of that ruminant animal to keep enough available protein uh, for a growing world. And I, I would add to that, um, that this whole, while we, we've seen the, the pandemic, we've seen the, econ the, the global recession, we may well see a slowdown. But as we see more and more of uh, emergence of folks into the middle class, uh, particularly across Southeast Asia, uh, China, and, and even more and more in Africa, uh, the first thing those folks want to do when they when they start seeing that stronger income is they want to increase the level of protein in their diet. <clears throat> so one of the uh, a really interesting article that uh, I was brought to my attention in preparing for this presentation was a, a research piece by by Dr. Roger Caddy. Uh, and I don't have uh, the full uh, title of here, but one of the key topics of his presentation was the elimination of, of idle cattle globally or, li or elimination of uh, idle livestock globally could reduce methane production by up to 47%. And specifically on what he was, was identifying as idle cattle is a mature animal that is not uh, for breeding, it's non-lactating, and it's not used for uh, draft labor. And, and specifically where we're seeing the, these uh, idle livestock, Southeast Asia, South America, and, and East Africa. And with the Southeast Asia component, he's specifically talking about the uh, the, the holy cows in India and the, the numbers of, of livestock that uh, are, are not used for any productive measures. Uh, he talks a fair amount about, particularly in East Africa, the number of people that are using cattle as a form of currency and, and how that representation of cattle ownership in those countries is, is a often represents a majority of family wealth. And that say, if we could, we could work those non-productive animals out of the system, uh, it, it would say, we could go from nine, the 9% 9 down, we could cut that uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the livestock or methane emissions uh, by half. I, and I, when I read that, I got to thinking about it and I think we could, well, it's not really the same thing in the U.S., but if you take the number of, of small producers uh, in, in areas of the U.S. that they really, they have a small herd of cows, they, they you know, gather those calves, take them to the sale barn, they're, they're not vaccinated, they're not, not weaned, but so many of those people are simply using that cow herd as a savings account. And when you have the transmission go out of the car or the refrigerator goes out, you simply sell a cow or two uh, to come up with the money to pay for that. So I think there's, to, to point the finger at, at India or East Africa, I think there's uh, areas in all parts of the world where we could really tighten up uh, the efficiency of the of the animals that we're we're handling today, uh, that in turn would would lower that greenhouse gas emission. 
the three people that uh, that I personally follow the most, and and again, this this list, I, I can think of several other people that I should have included in this, but uh, the work that uh, Dr. Frank Mentenoler is doing at UC Davis is absolutely amazing, and I and I think the entire uh, industry owes a great deal of gratitude to Frank for uh, for his willingness to step up and and present our side of the story. Uh, and the whole uh, GHC discussion. Certainly the work that uh, Dr. Sarah Place has done both uh, now that she's at Elanco, but while she was uh, with NCBA. And then uh, a gentleman that I wasn't familiar with that uh, I, I worked uh, with and heard him speak just this past March at the uh, International Livestock Congress was uh, Dr. Don Lehman at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana. But if you're looking for, for resources, uh, those are three, three great people to, to start with. <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the presentation that Dr. Lehman gave uh, there in Houston this spring, he was talking about the efficiency of production and talked about the, the, the various forms of diets with you start with a, a straight up vegetarian, uh, a, a pescatarian, uh, the Mediterranean diet, and then an, as an omnivore. But so many of the foods that are often championed or advocated uh, as being uh, low, low impact to the environment, those are foods that are very high in carbohydrates, more than most often have a, a, the lowest cost of production. And as you go out through that scale, uh, that the high, the, the cost of production and the equivalent nutritional equivalency of the, of the high end proteins at the far end, that, that it's way more, if, you know, the, where people want to be is out there with a higher level of protein consumption in their diets. And I, I thought that was, was really, really an, an interesting and a different way of, of looking at this whole discussion. And Dr. Lehman went on to take the nutritional density against the greenhouse gas emissions by crop and or by food group. And when you, when you convert that over to uh, GHCs per nutritional density, it is a massively levels the playing field and a lot of the, the misrepresentation that has fallen to animal agriculture and the beef industry is suddenly neutralized with, uh, when you talk about the, the, the greenhouse gases produced for uh, nutritional density of a lot of the uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, it, it entirely changes the, the playing field. Really good work in an area I'd like to see, see more of in the future. So just earlier this week, there was uh, some legislation that was introduced uh, by Senators Braun, Graham, uh, White House, Debbie Stabenow, but Growing Climate Solutions Act. And, and the, that legislation is to authorize the USDA to develop a program to generate carbon offset credits uh, and sequestering carbon and methane capture. And, and where they're going with this is they're trying to get US or to trying to clear the way for USDA to develop a program that producers can finally start to be paid for uh, sequestering carbon, uh, where producers can get paid for and livestock producers can get paid for methane capture. And I, I know we've got a lot of that going on, uh, particularly in California. But uh, I think this will be a, is a positive step and interesting legislation to see how it moves forward. Part of the driver behind this is the airline industry is currently scheduled to start paying uh, tax on their, their carbon release in 2021. Now, with the uh, absolutely absolute dismantling of the airlines that we have seen from the whole shutdown and travel, will, will that implementation of that carbon, carbon tax be implemented on time? I don't know. 
but but part of this program is to start aligning those when we start tracking that carbon production by industry those guys have to be buying those carbon credits where is an avenue that we can show um, the sequestrian and allow programs to uh, have a carbon carbon sink in both non-tillable ground and, and tillable ground and with in methane capture. <clears throat> All right, so the rest of this, I'm gonna start talking the, uh, the individual policies that we're seeing, just kind of a country by country of the major producers. Um, clear, before the, the whole COVID thing and, and our perspective on that we had peaked the current cattle cycle in, in uh, at the end of 2019, we expected to see uh, a, a contraction in the total number of cows in, in 20, probably 21. But our view at that time was that this corrective cycle would be both short and shallow. Um, as we've gone into the complexities of this, the numbers of cattle backed up, both uh, fed cattle and cattle outside of feed yards. I think that we really have to look at this, that it will be more of a conventional downside to the cycle. We're still, we're still looking to uh, hold our baseline on beef cow numbers basically at 30.5 to 31 million. So we're not, we're not in any way thinking this is so severe that we will go back to a sub 30 million beef cow number that we saw there in 2014. Uh, but we do think it's, it's gonna be deeper and take longer than what we were talking just a few months ago. Uh, I think the US is in a very strong position uh, to benefit from the trade deals that were reached in 2019. And, and we could spend the rest of the day debating will or will not China meet their obligations to the phase one deal. But the, at the end of the day, uh, they've had some really serious setbacks from COVID as, as, as we have. And they still, they're still, the, the ASF issue is still an ongoing problem with, with only nominal improvements. Uh, the, the, the tariff advantages that we have gained with the Japan agreement, uh, the improved uh, tariff uh, rates that we've gained with Taiwan, and then implementation of USMCA, uh, just US is in a much stronger position for global trade than, than where we were uh, a year ago. And you know, with absolute, as we see demand for protein and demand for beef going forward, I'm going to include North America because there's certainly some very high quality product being produced uh, in both Canada and Mexico. But the U.S. North America, we are pristinely positioned uh, to be the the global supplier of high quality protein, and uh, because of our feed grain supply and our and our fed beef uh, network, that will continue to pay dividends not just in a short term market but in a in a long term market. And then the last point that I would make for the U.S. is that it is a mature market. And the only way that we are going to see development and growth in our industry is with further development of exports. <clears throat> so when the, we look at each of the individual countries and, and both where they're at on a production basis, uh, where they're at with their level of exports, and then what are they doing for their representation uh, for the whole uh, roundtable, the whole greenhouse gas thing. And, and with many of these countries, they have the, the obligations that they made to the, to the Paris Agreement as, as those first benchmarks are coming due with the, to fulfill their obligations to the, to the Paris Agreement uh, that's stepping up the level of activity on the whole sustainability front. So with Brazil, uh, got a total cattle population of, of 232 million, predominantly a grass-fed model. The last real estimate that I, ha I had, I think they're, they're feeding about 7% of that cattle supply. I, and and you will, you'll be in conversations, well, they'll, they'll try to talk that as much as 10, but uh, the, the real takeaway, the percentage of fed beef production in Brazil opposed to grass-fed uh, still very, very low. 
exports are roughly 65% of, uh, of their total production. And when you look at uh, what are the challenges that they're saying, there's still economic and, and government vulnerabilities in Brazil uh, that may or may not be anything that we're directly talking about today, but just the long-term history of Brazil and, and that uh, economic volatility. Currently, uh, Brazil's uh, severely suffering uh, from COVID-19, more so in uh, across southern Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo and the, the heavier population areas. Uh, they've had some plant closures. In fact, there was a, an announcement just yesterday that uh, JBS will be reopening a plant that's been closed. But the, re the, the resources and the medical uh, capabilities uh, that they have in Brazil opposed to what's available here or in other places is a, is a big uncertainty. And then on the, uh, specifically on the sustainability front, you know, we had the issues that uh, night after night, uh, about this time last year, we were seeing a video of the fires going on in Brazil and there was a tremendous amount of debate at the time is, are they, are they burning ground to reclaim existing ground or are those fires new clearing of and and of the amazon and i had a lot of conversation i had a number of conversations with with our uh research crew in brazil and and asking for them um what's and i and i've heard both sides of that story and <clears throat> I don't know that I really feel that I fully understand the situation yet, but I, I can tell you that they were adamant that there was way more of those fires that were simply trying to reclaim existing ground than there was fires in, in clearing new ground. But as a result of that, there was some subsidy money, particularly from, uh, from the EU and, and the, the president of France and the president of uh, Brazil got into a little tiff, um, and and so Europe has has stopped supplying a good share of that uh, of that money to protect uh, the rainforest. So, of of what their policies are going forward for the sustainability front, probably Brazil. I have less of a clear cut picture on than than any place else. Uh, Australia. 25 and a half million cattle. Uh, that's roughly two thirds of grass fed program and one third is, is split and that's b between a short fed program that's a, a 90 to 110 day feeding program. A lot of that short fed product is what they use in their retail uh, counters domestically. And then they have the long fed cattle that's predominantly Wagyu based uh, that those cattle will have a full year to to uh, to 26 months on feed, uh, and that product is going shipped uh, a lot of it to China, and and an increasing share of it uh, coming to the U.S. Australia is exporting about 70 percent of of their production, and and there's a huge huge variation in cattle quality. Uh, between the, the manufacturing beef cattle out of Northern Australia and then the British based breeds uh, across Southern Australia. Uh, really has nothing to do with this conversation, but, I, but I'll just share, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be on a call Monday evening with Australia as they try to look and, and think of ways that they can implement risk management tools and strategies uh, and, and or do they do they try again to introduce futures? Do they do they introduce a government-supported options program? Uh, that, but the the price vulnerability is is an ongoing problem. Um, if you take where Australia is at with the, uh, they have been so consumed with drought over the last uh, three years that. Their, their real emphasis has just been, how do we stay in, a, in business day to day? Now, since early spring, they've had some very good rains and very broad range uh, on, on geographic coverage. 
that has enabled them to start retaining females and uh, they're seeing slowdowns and closures of, of beef plants because they're simply not getting enough inventory of cattle into the plant uh, to keep operating. Um, they have a, naturally when they live, when you live on the bubble and any, any damaging climate change would, would make a very vulnerable country even more vulnerable, uh, the Australians have a great deal of worry about climate change. Their, their uh, sustainability program is what they refer to as CN30, and that's carbon neutral by 2030 is what that stands for. But when you look beyond what's being discussed and, and what's being implemented, uh, I think they're giving it a lot of discussion, but I really don't know that there's any really solid uh, programs come out of it yet. Most of the proposals that they're working with are still based on uh, producer option programs that uh, it's going to be the decision of the, have, have several options, but have the uh, discretion of the producer of which avenue he knew he, he implements for his operation uh, to be as, as less um, intrusive as possible. One last point on, Aus on Australia and, and, and I, I've, I spend a fair amount of time down, down there. Um, on on policy-wise, Australia still has very strong alliances with the United States and is, is heavily dependent on the US for their security uh, purposes globally. But as they've seen a, a, an ever-increasing share of their trade volume go to China, uh, it is causing them a great deal of uh, angst and, and how it's kind of that classic deal of the impossibility of serving two masters. Do they, do they follow their, their trade relationships with China or do they stay tied uh, with, the, with the U.S. for security? Uh, that's going to give them a lot of grief going forward on any kind of both large domestic programs or certainly international programs. Uh, New Zealand, there's only 4.9 people, uh, million people and, and 1.25 million of them live in Auckland uh, and, and a cattle population of, of 10 million cattle. Um, I love it down there. I, it is just gorgeous. But uh, a lot of challenges. Their their big challenge with uh, greenhouse gas and and New Zealand exports 80 to 85 percent of their production, and more and more of that supply has gone to China and Southeast Asia. We're not seeing the quantity of uh, New Zealand manufacturing product coming to the states that we've seen historically. <clears throat> but when I was last in, in uh, New Zealand and I met with a bunch of uh, the industry folks, they were really keen on wanting to build a global brand that was capitalizing on, uh, on their blue skies, the pristine water and, and year round green grass. And, and I agreed with them. I said, I, I think that's the perfect position for you guys to be in. But unfortunately, a handful of years ago, uh, they heavily went to a dairy-based uh, uh, genetics program. They, they had that uh, very large uh, milk dehydrating uh, company built down there that was uh, to use a lot of that milk and they were selling the dry powdered milk into Asia. Uh, so I think, they're, I think their idea is right on, on their brand building, but unfortunately they've got, now they've got the wrong uh, set of core genetics to build on the, the brand they want to build. Agriculture is 50% of, of, of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture accounts for 50% of that. So it puts them in a really difficult spot to meet their obligations to the Paris Agreement. And as a result of that, they've, they've implemented some very stringent uh, sustainability laws that all has to do with water testing and water purity. Uh, the the big uh, penalties involved with the level of nitrogen runoff that they're getting from both cultivated and non-cultivated uh, ground. 
um, that's this is going to be an interesting one to watch going forward because uh, if everybody else doesn't play along, New Zealand's really got themselves painted into a corner. The EU uh, total population of 445 million people, a cattle population at uh, 89 million, still largely a, uh, a multi-purpose uh, found breed foundation base. Um, they've never they've never regained the level of beef consumption that they had across the EU prior to uh, the BSE event. And, and it's just, I wish I, I try to understand Europe and I just, I'm good. I'm going to confess, I, I get confused really, really quickly. Of, of the policies that have uh, sustainability policies and that have been proposed, one is uh, that's gotten a lot of discussion is the TAPP pro proposal, and that is to implement a series of taxes by 20 full implementation by 2030 that would put uh, in an EU dollars a uh, 47 cent uh, tax per 100 grams of beef, uh, a 36 cent tax on pork, and a 17 cent uh, tax EU tax on broilers and and their view is that over time that would reduce chicken consumption uh, by 30 percent pork consumption by 57 percent and beef consumption by by 68 percent now without saying this policy is really one that has been advocated by the greens and it's it's questionable how much they will uh how much they'll go down this road, but but it's one that gives a, a lot of pause. The other, when I when I talk with the the the, the bank folks down there, they say, look, whatever Europe does, it's going to be way more focused on taxation and reduction of greenhouse gases through the use of fossil fuels than it will be over a reduction in the the level of of methane, and. I think when you when you actually stop and talk with them, all of the proposal greenhouse gas proposals being discussed in in Europe today still have very strong ties into classic European ag policy, and that being that you know Europe has a very long history of experiences of being hungry. That goes, you know, as far back in history as you want to go, but but certainly World War One and World War Two and the devastation that occurred across Europe, they are hypersensitive about having a shortage of food, and and the, and the results of that, and and their ag policy, where the U.S. U.S. Uh, poverty policy was to build uh, high-rise buildings and and pile people into the inner city. Um, Europe's policy has always been to keep those people rural, provide them with small plots of land that they can assist or grow their own food. And, and that's still a, a real driver uh, at the core of their mentality uh, to this day and will have an influence on whatever they do for uh, greenhouse gas policy. The 900 pound gorilla in the room, and I'm about to finish this up, but uh, you know, China and, and what what they do, talking 1.4 billion people. They do have a cattle population of 97 million, but uh, a, a fully populated inventory of hogs of uh, 6.75 million. Uh, I hear that, I hear the half a billion hog number somewhere in there. Broiler production, 5.27 billion. Uh, you just, it's, it's difficult for us to comprehend the mass of, of production, but also the mass of that population base. Uh, the, China's goal is to be independent on, on pork and, and broiler production. That may or may not happen going forward, but they're openly admitting that they will have a dependency on the importation of beef, that they do not have either the available land mass or the uh, available feed supply to support a, a beef production program. Um, when I talk with uh, the bank folks in, in 
Hong Kong. Uh, they're, they are talking a really positive story. They're talking about more and more of the uh, QSR restaurants are reopening, talking about more and more of the, of the street vendors, uh, reduced constraints on, on travel, and that the business climate is improving and that they are making a very solid uh, post-COVID recovery. They still have uh, a lot of concerns of, okay, what happens if we, if we have additional rounds of this uh, going forward, but, but a much better story than what we had even a few weeks ago. The current political environment in Hong Kong is an incredibly explosive uh, situation. And, and not only is that explosive for global politics and, and human rights, but the majority of the, the, the US and European banks that are in Hong Kong are the banks that clear business for product trade with China. And if, if, if we see that situation deteriorate to a point that those international banks start leaving Hong Kong, the ability to do trade with China is going to be much more complicated uh, than what it was uh, has, has been in recent years. And the last point I'm going to make is that, uh, and I, and this is my personal opinion. It's not any anything that I can can quote from any of the sources, but I just think it's imperative that that China does away with the wet markets. And I think a lot of the, uh, the disease issues uh, and animal health issues that we've seen, uh, that is really a root of, of a lot of the problem. And with that, I will uh, open it up. Great, thanks, Don. That was uh, really an interesting talk. And uh, I, I'm always fascinated by the um, you know, demographics and, and you know, cattle numbers around the planet and certainly the, the product, production differences that we have in, uh, in the beef value chain around the planet. And, and certainly I think we're in a, a great position here in the United States and um, uh, genetics plays a, a growing role in how we might uh, move ahead in terms of, of sustainability in, in the beef sector. Um, and that, uh, that same opportunity lies uh, for producers of uh, beef cattle uh, around the planet. Um, we do have uh, uh, a few questions already posted up in the uh, in the Q and A, um, and encourage. I forgot to to post everybody earlier. If you're uh, planning on asking a question, uh, please do that in the question and answer or Q and A segment of uh, the Zoom app. And so you'll find that typically at the bottom of your screen and uh, have the ability to uh, just click on that and it opens a new window. But we've got uh, three, three questions up so far uh, and we'll take a few minutes here to, uh, to work through those, Don, if that's all right. That's fine. Sure, uh, the first one from Tyler says, what role is soil health micro and macro fauna diversity playing in beef production sustainability conversation or in the beef production sustainability wow. conversation? I the first, the, the, the best way I can answer that question is you're, you're talking outside of my wheelhouse, but, but I do think it's, I think it's very, very important. I, and I, th and I think our understanding of soil health and the, and the quantity uh, and variation of microbes and living things that, I mean, I, I see that as a real opportunity for study I don't know if, in, if the world, if, if anybody's the, the, the go-to expert, but I'm certainly not. But I do think it's a very positive opening. Yeah, it's part of the, the, the tenets of, you know, sustainability is not just about environment. It's not just about um, farm or enterprise level profitability or the social aspects of animal welfare. So far, that's the, the union of all those things yes. and the intersections between them. So, yes. yep, great, great perspective. Um, uh, Marty's posted a, a question here and it's a, it's a little long, so I'll, I'll kind of work, work through it, but it says, is it possible to uncouple the environmental issues segment of our industry's challengers uh, from the animal rights group detractors through science research, um, facts, improvements and strategy or not? Um, some recent political partnerships seek out or, or reek of that illogical relationship. So the, the 
teamwork of those organizations um, uh, against uh, uh, the beef sector. Um, what, what's your take there, Don? I think it's possible. I think that even if it is possible, it is going to be very, very slow. And, and I think that, I think that industry has, has been very slow to the table and not just on the animal welfare front, but, uh, but on a whole explanation of what it is we do to provide protein to, and, and food to 330 million uh, people a day plus exports that it, I'm going to say it, I, I'll, I'll agree that I think it's possible, but I think there's a lot of work to be done and that uh, production agriculture is going to have to become much more assertive and explaining our, telling our story to ever get to that point. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good perspective and there's, there's certainly lots of good things that uh, happen every day in our business uh, here in the States and around the world and, and you know, the upcycling components of um, beef cattle as ruminants and, um, you know, that contribution to, you know, sustainable food production is one that I think over, gets overlooked often and uh, is, is really something, you know, we need to champion and it's not, not, not leadership's responsibility to champion that. It's individual producers to also help champion that and, and have that communication discussion with our consumers. So, um, one uh, another comment, and maybe Don, you can uh, point me the right way, and I'll post it up in the uh, in the group chat box. But there was a uh, a comment that's uh, from Amy, and she said, uh, "I found the statistics on idle cattle and methane emissions very interesting." Um, would you please uh, share a citation for that article? Um, I can. Uh, I don't have it in here with me, and I thought I better bring that in here, and I and I didn't. Okay. Bob, I will get it to you, and you can get it posted. Okay, but sounds I great. I do have appreciate, it. appreciate that very much. Great. Um, and it's a very good read. A very good read. Excellent. Um, and Amy already posted up in the chat box. Thank you. So thanks, Don. Excellent. Um, cool. Well, um, that's uh, uh, a couple of the questions. We have a, a few more here. Um, we'll probably not get to all of them, but uh, uh, we'll try, try to get through a, a couple more here real quickly. Um, Neville asks, uh, how do we get around some of the very strong and polarizing sentiments with respect to sustainability? I, I think we're getting there, um, and I and I think I, I I touched on that a little bit in my early remarks when when we first started having the sustainability discussion, uh, when there was a a, a global control uh, spin on that, and and it was largely on a, an environmental front, and I think producers took the idea that that uh, Big Brother was going to be out there mandating what they could or couldn't do on their farm. And I think we've, we've got a broader understanding of what we're talking about may be third party verification, but they're not telling you what you can or can't do. Um, the, other, the other part of that that I think has really broadened that discussion is when we start talking about people and community relationships, um, and we, and, and we have a much better understanding that economic sustainability is, is at the, the top of that list. Uh, I just think the whole conversation, I'm gonna say, I think producers are, are, are coming around to this as a much more palatable conversation and palatable format than what the initial perceptions were when the programs were first being discussed. Excellent. Um, and the last one we'll run at you here, Don. Um, uh, what's your view? And this is from Jerry. And uh, um, it's a great, great question. Um, what's your view on the value of the dollar since the United States has pumped so much money into the economy? Inflation concerns. Uh, how do we prepare if inflation, if, if inflation comes to rural ag? That is... Uh, <clears throat> That is a question that internally uh, at the bank, we are spending a lot of time on. And 
I would say that uh, my first observation of this is that uh, after spending just a short amount of time talking about it, the U.S. has adopted monet uh, modern monetary theory uh, with open arms, and and we're certainly going to see we uh, employ the experiment of can we can we spend our way out of this problem? I. I have a lot of reservations. I'm just going to tell. I'm, I'm going to be dead honest. Uh, I, I have a, I have an, enough of a traditional slant on economics that uh, I think that's still still somewhere in my brain. Somebody's got to be there to pay the bills. But I would also say we're we're far far from removed uh, from from this whole subsidy situation, both to agriculture and uh, to consumers. Uh, and collectively, you know, when when I I was on that working group uh, that was led by Daryl Peel, that that we were asked to calculate the economic damages of COVID, you know, when it first started, and we came up with that uh, 13.6 billion dollars. And when on the very first phone call I had to be a, asking me to be a part of that program. The statement was made that view this as a one and done. We do not want to look at this as an ongoing subsidy program. Before we even got that calculation determined, we had gone from shutting down the economy, closing the restaurants, the transition to retail sales for groceries. And, and then before we were even finished, it was becoming very obviously obvious that these bee plants are or these meat plants are going to be shut down or slowed radically so even before we got that first piece of work out the door we were already seeing the need that there will be additional bites at the apple before this is over with so um you're gonna uh, i think i've answered the question but it's it's far from resolved Yeah, very, very interesting for sure uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, the impact we're going to have on, on the economy in that regard. Um, sort of another uh, uh, kind of co related question from Wes says, could creation of a carbon offset market ultimately affect cattle value? Well, yes. Yes. Um, if, if, if we come up with... With, with revenue streams outside of, of conventional production, um, will that enable people to pay higher prices for, you know, for a cow or, or, or stalker cattle? When you have a secondary revenue stream coming from somewhere, uh, yeah, I think it has a very big impact on production agriculture going forward. Great. Well, Don, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, to see you. Uh, hopefully next time it'll be uh, a face-to-face -face meeting where we're uh, together, but uh, um, really enjoyed your comments today and, and certainly appreciate the perspective that brings um, to, uh, to our attendees as we think about uh, opportunities to improve uh, beef sustainability and through genetics and how that might uh, impact us uh, economically. So Don, thanks again from uh, our, uh, our organization. We appreciate uh, you spending some time with us today and your insights. You're more than welcome. I'm happy to be with you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Don.
of Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs>